overview of what I was planning to cover now, um, just to show you where the Namaku District is, uh, the climate response work we've been doing there. Uh, we're going to work through that quite quickly and then try and focus a bit on the lessons learned um, slide. It's just one. And um, maybe we can work through the gaps in challenges because we've been talking about a lot of those things already today. Um, the climate maps I'm going to show are all by Guy and Stephen Holmes, um, who worked on a mindfulness assessment with us last year. Um, so, just for those of you who don't know where the market district is, we are up there in the north coast, um, and it's got a population of about 126,000 and the area is 126,000. So, there's one person almost exactly per square kilometer. It's not a lot. Um, the main economic activities are mining and agriculture there. Um, the current climate is pretty hot um, and it's pretty dry. <laughs> Um, so what we are expecting there, um, and these are the scenarios that Guy and Stephen were working on, um, this is the statistical approach, um, looking at sort of 90th, median and 10th percentile scenarios, so base versus median case scenarios for temperature and rainfall, um, and basically pretty clear signal we're looking at getting hotter into the future, we only went to 2050 with these. Um, and we have sort of some historical trends that indicate that it is actually um, getting hotter. So temperatures increasing under all scenarios. Um, rainfall um, getting dry, I don't know. Rainfall predictions are much more variable. We've got wetting and drying predictions, so it's very difficult to say what's going to happen around rainfall there. Um, but we've been starting with the climate change response process with the district municipality there a couple of years back already. Um, so we started by working with them around the disaster management plan um, and integrating climate change into the disaster management planning processes. Um, we worked on a vulnerability assessment, um, looking at what are the impacts of climate change that we can expect or what are some of the threats um, and how do those interact with existing pressures there. So we looked at ecological, institutional and um, socioeconomic vulnerabilities that are already existing and how those might interact with climate change in the future. Uh, we've had several climate focus conferences and learning exchanges, so we've been able to bring some really specialist um, scientists, researchers, practitioners, and that up to Springbok and Namakwa to interact with our uh, government officials and other stakeholders um, around these issues. Uh, we worked on a renewable energy spatial tool up there, a simple Google Earth tool um, containing a whole lot of information about where might be good areas to. Uh, focus for renewable energy development. They're quite keen to lead on that in that space. Um, and we're working on the lessons from the MAFRA, how do we use those to inform the provincial climate change response policy, which is in draft. And we've been working with Salga, Cocta, and DIA, um, as well as the GIZ, on the rollout of the Let's Respond Toolkit, which is a toolkit for local municipalities on um, integrating the risks and opportunities of climate change into the municipal planning. Um, but mostly focused on the integrated development plan, which is the planning document. Um, this process um, we're doing through a series of workshops at the district level and with every one of the local municipalities in the area. And we look at introducing climate impacts, um, discussing the role of municipalities in climate change response, uh, mapping out climate vulnerability or mapping out vulnerability to extreme weather events. So really trying to tap into what is the experience of the officials responding to weather-related extreme events and dealing with things like droughts and flooding and so on already. Um, so the idea is to try and really mobilize that local experience so people don't feel like this is a new and foreign thing. Um, we've been trying to get, uh, get a handle on what they already know uh, and are familiar with and try and link that with climate um, change in the future. Um, evaluating the IDPs and projects for climate responsiveness um, facilitating some planning and project design and budgeting um, and really encouraging lesson sharing with other municipalities. So I wanted to spend some time on, on this slide, the key lessons coming out of this question. I hope you don't mind if I refer to my notes if there's so many discussions that I've been adding all the time. <laughs> um, so we, we took the 2050 time frame and we did that for lots of good reasons, I think, about not being alarmist and what it, you know, not uh, getting too involved in those um, emissions scenario, uncertainties into the future, what is depending on what decisions get made now. Um, but I think longer term scenarios could also be useful in sort of catalyzing a bit more um, 
bit more action. Like Bruce was saying, if we, if we are heading for a six degree increase in temperature, and that means large scale intensification, we need to also figure out how do you communicate a message like that. Um, so we haven't been, uh, we haven't been doing that yet. But the first point on the sensitizing, uh, raising awareness about climate change and its life impact is very, very important. And this guy um, in the top corner there, Chris Fontaine, he is um, local economic development and 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 many, many portfolios, also acting MMR. But anyway, he's a climate change champion working very closely with us in the Namaka district. And he said, if I didn't know about this, I wouldn't have worried about it at all. Uh, but now you've put me in an awkward position of having to think about this and try to figure out how to respond to this. So I think um, we can bring officials into that awkward position with us. <laughs> um, and having said that, we need to do that in a way that links in with their existing work. So we don't, don't try and make this a whole big new extra add-on. Um, it's, it's difficult to address kind of new things and extra things when, especially at the local level like this, um, we don't have a lot of extra capacity. Um, much easier to address immediate needs and concerns and linking climate change to existing activities, existing priorities, existing budgets, um, being respectful of the non-climate stresses that these guys are dealing with um, every day is really important and I think really, really possible to bring climate change into that space. Um, so another thing that uh, that helps is, is linking um, climate change with areas of responsibility and mandates that are already well understood uh, by municipal officials and trying to bring it into spaces that are familiar. Um, so then the next point on there was mainstreaming and um, it's very, very useful and it's been very really useful to have a science-based document especially relevant for the decision makers in the market district. Um, to be able to draw on that, and that that document, that vulnerability assessment, has got climate information in, but it's also got information about non-climate stresses and problems with that. Um, having something like that to draw on allows you to then take portions of that out where they're relevant and feed them into other planning documents and other policy documents as they fit. So rather than going necessarily always for a separate adaptation plan or separate planning document, you might want to think about making targeted and strategic inputs into um, existing processes and planning documents that you guys are already working with. Um, the spatial representation of information is, sorry, excuse the spelling of the is a really important one and sometimes, and I'm talking mostly about maps here, but there's sort of in more interactive ways of working with maps or you can just have a thing to look at. Um, sometimes maps can be very confusing and we've seen some today, I think, that are pretty tough maps for interpreting if you're not, um, if you're not familiar with them. Uh, but sometimes a map can be a really, really good thing and uh, the spatial, spatial prioritizing really helps with project planning and budgeting and things like that that makes, which is very clear. I found that people we've been working with have responded very, very well to images and maps. Um, and using a sensible political boundary as well. So whether it's national, you know, the South African boundary or the Namaku district boundary, a boundary that makes sense and is useful for decision makers in government um, has worked. Um, and you can use different things at broad scales and showing ranges of possibility is okay. Um, found that the guys that we've been working with in the market just are very, cap very capable of dealing with uncertainty and are very able to engage with a range of possibility rather than a specific impact. Um, and the spatial tools have helped us to, um, to do that. Um, and there are wonderful things out there like the CSIR maps. I'm sure you guys have seen Francois' animation. It goes from 1983 to 2100, and it's very shocking. It gets hotter and hotter and hotter. But a thing like that is brilliant. It gets people talking. It's very visual. It makes a huge impact, and it gets people talking straight away. Um, so these special tools are great. Um, local champions and partners, again, having somebody there to drive things. Keep people inspired, keep people motivated to lead. 
Um, it's really, really important to keep climate change on the agenda. Um, and this person preferably is a really influential senior person. If you can, although having, having to support them is also fine. Um, and sometimes it's a partner who drives things too, and I'm not sure, I guess, is that okay? Sometimes it's an NGO partner, sometimes it's an academic partner who's also pushing and driving things. Um, and maybe if that partner is out of the equation, that's the whole process as well. And is that, you know, is it okay to just have as a vision for these things really long term partnerships? Um, around funding, um, often, and out of the Let's Just One Toolkit, there's a recommendation to have a talk about um, climate change as an unfunded mandate. Um, and I haven't found that, that conversation very useful always. Um, I don't think it's a strong argument against working on climate change response, and the officials will always tell you it's an unfunded mandate. We don't have a budget for this. We don't have it in our performance um, targets. It doesn't fit anywhere in what we're doing already. So I don't find that worrying about the funding is, is very useful, because a lot can be achieved, as Penny was saying, of just rethinking the way that you're doing things currently. So rather than having a lot of new projects, seeing this as a totally different thing, rather just rethinking what you're doing um, in terms of delivery on the funding level. So look into what are the kinds of services that we're doing to um, And how to just rethink those, bring in a bit more climate responsiveness in there. Sometimes you can just switch funds um, And you want to be going for climate response options that have multiple benefits. So if you don't um, have, you know, if you don't have the changes that you're expecting, you're still going to win. You want your options to be showing multiple benefits. Um, and my last point there is have some fun with it. Um, participatory and interactive methods work really well um, in getting uh, building some practical understanding of the issues that we're dealing with, um, as well as building commitment to the process. Um, and I think focusing on and having a kind of a good time together, building relationships, enjoying the process is also really important in keeping people committed and bought in um, to carry on working with you. Um, so gaps and challenges I'll just went through this really quick because people have mentioned these already today. Uh, it can be very difficult to get people together and to stay focused. And it can be very difficult to get the right, the right people in the room. Um, your senior managers, your counselors, political decision makers, and that kind of thing. Especially all at the same time, you want to get them by their own. <laughs> um, it's quite difficult to allocate responsibilities for climate change. It doesn't fit easily into anyone's job description. Um, and it's been difficult to reach clearly stated and signed all objectives, although people are working on climate change response, talking about it, doing things, there's some action happening, um, having this clearly stated and signed off is, is quite tough, but change can be slow. Um, and it also can happen in fits and starts, so you have a bit of, bit of things happening and it all goes quiet for a while and you pick up again. Um, so what's come out of our discussions with the market district is they would like to see <coughs> Be a national director to local municipalities. What are you expecting from us? What, you, what is the role? Very, very clear. Whose role is what and who is responsible for what? Um, we are obviously from conservation South Africa. Many of our, our collaborators to date have come out of environment departments and, and other environmental backgrounds. So the integration of socioeconomic vulnerabilities is challenging and has been a gap for us, so we work on that. Um, and we haven't had historical climate change for the market. That would be really useful, but I was trying to play about this in much. And she has to it's on the way. And then that last point is um, what I was trying to get at earlier. Um, is that once you've, so, so in this case, conservation South Africa and NGO are working with local government. In other cases, my new research institution. Um, once you've started this process with the government, you're committed to your long 